Okay, so welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, I'm Kathy Brown, and I'm a community and economic development educator with the University of Illinois Extension. Um, today's webinar is going to be recorded uh, so that we can make it available on the Extension's local government education website. Um, during our program today, we're going to look at health and all policies. And this is really about a collaborative approach that will integrate health considerations into policy making to improve the health of communities and people. Uh, the program is made possible through the University of Illinois Extension, which provides um, equal opportunities in programs and employment. And if you need uh, a reasonable accommodation to participate in programming, you should always contact your local Extension office and they can help to ensure that that's possible. Uh, to make sure that today's uh, program, which is being recorded, uh, it has the best possible quality. The microphones are going to be muted during the presentation. However, we do want to encourage you to add questions in the chat space. Um, if you have any problems with connecting, you can add those as well uh, to that chat space. Uh, and our technical folks who are on this call will be able to respond and provide um, assistance. Um, also, as part of this programming effort, we always want to hear from you, um, not only today, but for future programs. And so we'll be emailing to you a link uh, following this program that gives you an opportunity to give us evaluation feedback and let you know where you can go to listen to the um, recording of today's program. So we thank you for your support and participation. I want to give just a, a really brief um, introduction for today's presenter. Had the um, privilege of working with Laura on a number of, of different projects on, on in Western Illinois. And she's a tremendous asset to our region in so many ways. Um, as an assistant director for the Office of Regional Programs with the S Southern Illinois University School of Medicine, Laura Hepkelsill um, began her position in 2014 in the regional office um, that is serving the Western Illinois region. Her office is housed within the Grand Health System uh, in Canton, Illinois, but she really uh, has done an uh, exceptional job of serving the entire Western Illinois region. Um, her responsibilities include partnering with local stakeholders in order to address uh, community health issues in a 20-county region. She also works directly with the assistant provost of clinical and external affiliations in the regional health efforts. And she supports interdepartmental efforts that expand the school's programs in population health and regional service programs. So at this time, I'd, I'd like to welcome um, Laura Hepketzel. Thank you, Kathy. Um, it was a kind introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Kathy mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about health and all policies today. Um, this, again, is a collaborative approach, as Kathy mentioned. And um, I don't think I'm telling, I'll be telling anyone, anyone they, anything they don't know, but might just hopefully spur um, some additional thought into how you can consider working health into um, other areas um, that you might be doing in your personal and professional life. Um, so our agenda today, we're going to talk about just an overview and key elements of the health not policies approach. Um, I'm going to give some specific examples of health not policies, um, particularly that our office has been engaged in or just aware of in Illinois, as well as a resource page and my contact information. Um, before we get started, this is probably not what you want to hear at the beginning of a webinar, but I would not say I'm an expert in this area. Again, I just feel it's an important approach for others to be aware of and consider as you're working on projects. Um, I'm trying to be a conduit to share this information with you. Um, in addition to my outreach role with the SIU School of Medicine, I also serve as a county board member in Fulton County, so I have an interesting opportunity to witness this approach from different perspectives. Um, I also have a few colleagues that uh, are going to try to join us today. Some of them have, some of them haven't yet. Um, and they can add to the conversation, especially when we're getting some of the examples that they've been involved in. Uh, Dr. Dave Stewart, Dr. Samir Vora, Patrice Jones, and Arden Caffrey. Um, I, again, a disclaimer, um, the majority of information that is outlined in this entire presentation, um, giving you the general overview and um, 
of the Health and All Policies approach is taken directly from our wonderful guide that's available online for you to download. It's about 170 pages, so it has a lot of great information in it. Um, there's, I've, I tried to include the highlights, and I included a lot of information, but there's so much more in that document. So there um, is the, the information, the citation for that document, and at the end there's a link um, to that document. Again, I would encourage you to download that, look through it. Um, there's a, just so much detail. It's, it's a wealth of information, and we're lucky that it's available for us. Um, a lot of the information provided in the guide is, guide is specifically aimed at governmental officials and how they engage with other stakeholders, but there's so much detail provided it wouldn't be hard to see how it could be approached from a different perspective. Um, honestly, I, I tried, I, I'm citing that uh, guide and so I hope that I haven't intentionally not cited something else. So again, please refer to this guide. These are the experts in this area and they've spent all this time putting this information together and it's so relevant to what we're doing um, in our work. So health and all policies um, is a collaborative approach to improving the health of all people by incorporating health considerations in the decision making across sectors and policy areas. Um, if you were able to join us a couple of weeks ago for Dr. Vora's presentation on the social determinants of health, I would like to consider this as kind of a part two to that presentation where we discuss some of the ways you can actually address those social determinants of health. Um, again, I'm going to try to hit on some of the key points, but there's much more information out there available. Um, so conditions in the places where we pe where people live, learn, work, play, um, they all affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes, and these conditions are known as the social determinants of health. So health and all policies is an approach to address those um, health outcomes and health inequities. Some of the um, elements of the health and all policies approach include promoting health equity and sustainability, supporting intersectoral collaboration, benefit multiple partners, engage stakeholders, and create structural or process change. So all good things as you're working um, in this area. So health and all policies encompasses a wide spectrum of activities and can be implemented in many different ways. It can be one-time collaborative efforts uh, with a single partner. It also could be big government approaches to involving um, ongoing collaboration across several different agencies or institutions. Um, all parts of the spectrum can help further this approach and they're all very important, but of course it's most effective whenever um, it goes beyond a one-time interaction or one-issue collaboration. It's something that becomes more embedded in policy. Um, so the approach seeks to institutionalize considerations of health, equity, and sustainability as standard part decision-making processes across a broad array of, broad array of sectors. So um, you can start this at any level and it's important either way, but of course the long-term goal is to try to get this embedded and, and um, it doesn't have to be brought up every time people automatically are, are looking at health and all policies when they're working on different um, topics or areas. Some of you have, may have heard of this, um, the following parable about um, the river, there's a drowning man, someone jumps in to try to save them before they can get them resuscitated or jumping in to save the next man, so on and so forth. And at the end it says, I was so busy jumping in, pulling them to shore, applying artificial respiration that I had no time to see who the hell is upstream pushing them all in. So th there's different versions of this. Another one uses crying babies instead of a drowning man. Either way, it's trying to get people to look at maybe what's causing those issues. Of course, you want to save the drowning man and the baby, but why are they in the water in the first place? So trying to look at that policy change um, that can influence and, and help people and save people. So there's no right way to do this work. All health and all policies initiatives will require that people across different sectors work together as a group, but the membership level formality and activities of the group will vary. So unless you've been explicitly mandated to start some sort of health and all policies initiative, um, your first step is probably going to be to just look for an opportunity to in introduce this approach. Um, it could be just working with a partner that you know that you've maybe worked with before or not um, to address a specific community need, or even if you have been um, directed to to work on a health policies approach, whether that be through legislation or executive order, there's still always room for creative process um, and inviting other partners in and, and figuring out what your priorities are. Um, in this guide that I told you about and encourage you to download, 
Um, it walks you through each step of the health and all policies approach, and it includes a number of food for thought sections, which can serve as helpful tools as you're trying to incorporate this process into your work. I've included a couple of these food for thought tools into the presentation, but I don't intend to spend a lot of time on them. Again, I would encourage you to go to that guide and look at them. Um, very detailed, very good uh, thought-provoking questions and checklist for you to consider as you're working on whatever the topic is. Um, so in this one, for example, the first um, one I included, it talks about questions you can ask yourself as you're looking for opportunities to apply this approach. So if you're in the very beginning and not sure where to start, you know, are there existing or newly formed interagency initiatives that have potential health implications that you can get involved in? Um, are there single agency initiatives that would benefit from a partnership with additional agencies? Is your agency or another agency going through a strategic planning process? And that would be a good point to um, try to work in the health not policies approach. A new or ongoing process where health metrics or data could be added. What partners have you worked with successfully in the past? And is there a particular health issue of significant concern to community groups? Are they asking for something to be done about it? So again, all good questions that get you thinking, um, maybe thinking outside the box of what you hadn't thought about before. So um, again, there's some great information in this guide. Another um, one would be ask yourself as you begin to move forward with a particular policy project or strategy, you know, why it's important for health to become a part of the process, the key leaders, what do you want others to do, are there human or financial resources, do you know your stakeholders and their views on the issue. So good questions, thought-provoking, um, important in this kind of work. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a root cause uh, mapping is a structure process for identifying key factors contributing to the community health problems. Um, this method involves repeatedly asking why to help people identify the causes of causes or the social determinants of the issues they seek to address. So this is a, a hypothetical story about Jason, a child in the hospital, um, and this is an example of a root cause map. So why is Jason in the hospital? Because he had a bad infection in his leg. Why does he have an infection? Because he has a cut on his leg and it got infected. But why does he have a cut on his leg? Because he was playing in the junkyard next to his apartment building and there was some sharp, jagged steel there that he fell on. But why was he playing in a junkyard? Because his neighborhood is kind of run down and a lot of kids pay there, play there because there's no one to supervise them. But why does he live in that neighborhood? Well, because his parents can't afford a nicer place to live. And why can't they afford a nicer place to live? Because his dad's unemployed and his mom's sick. And why is his dad employed, unemployed? Because he doesn't have much education, he can't find a job. So you have to continually ask those why questions to try to get to the root of the problem and figure out what it is that needs to be addressed to then, you know, it will follow into why Jason's in the hospital. There were a lot of steps in between those two things, but um, it's just an example of a, of, of a way to do an exercise to try to figure out what the actual problem is that you can try to work on. Um, in this guide, they talk about the different partners and roles, and as I mentioned, it's aimed at um, state, uh, state agency stakeholder, or state agencies as partners and stakeholders, meaning um, people that are outside their organization and maybe local government. So um, again, with those food for thought checklists, there's some really great ones around partners and roles and who should do what, um, whether it's government partners, champions in the community, you need backbone staff to keep things moving, and stakeholders. So when you're engaging stakeholders, there's um, a number of ways in which you can do that in the health and all policies initiatives that can help. So foster a better understanding of the roles of different governmental agencies at the local, regional, state, and federal levels and the impacts of their policies and programs or community health and well-being. Um, facilitate development of intersectoral relationships among new partners, bring new resources and skills to the table, increase understanding of the social determinants of health within non-governmental uh, sectors. Stakeholder engagement might include community workshops, meetings, forums, formal or informal advisory groups, and public input periods at government meetings or hearings. So there's different ways to engage stakeholders depending on what your issue is, what your resources are, what opportunities are presented to you. So just keep that in mind. There, there's probably always a way to do it that makes the most sense for um, whatever you're working on. So local governments as key stakeholders. Um, when you, uh, stakeholder engagement will look for different state and local governments. So a local government can have direct involvement with community residents whose lives and living environments are impacted by policy decisions. And state agencies often seek input from representatives of communities, including state-level organizations that garner input from local organizations and local government. 
Um, if you're working at a state level, local agencies can have critical insight into the feasibility or challenges of various proposals that they're often the ones implementing decisions made by your state level partners. Local government representatives can also help remind state level partners of local needs. So again, there's just so many different ways to get the information you need and to uh, make an impact in the area. So just, of course, just look and see what makes sense based on your needs and your resources, um, who you would work with. Different ways to engage stakeholders, of course, engage them where they are. There's online community engagement, tenant survey to support change, and of course, visioning process. Um, and a good example of visioning process is the mapping program at Western Illinois University within their Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs. Um, they meet with community members over the course of a few months and help the community identify common interests and goals and then help them develop plans to move forward. So there's some programs already in place that you could um, uh, take advantage of or utilize, as well as um, you might be able to create your own within your community. So this example is specific to community engagement in public health and the different levels of community participation that can occur, depending on how the engagement is approached. So it's a ladder community participation. There's several different levels um, of how the health department would um, participate with the or would engage with the community community participation. So you can this could be um, you could be, consider this in all different areas, not just health departments, but it just gives you some ideas, um, again, to consider later when you have time, um, just to, as you're moving forward, seeing what makes the most sense for your initiative. So of course, you want to work together across sectors. Um, it can take different forms, ranging from simply sharing information, all the way to creating new projects and collaborating on those um, and integrating within each other's work. Interagency collaboration requires strong relationships that are built on a foundation of trust, mutuality, and reciprocity. Sorry. <clears throat> Interagency partnerships will benefit from reaching agreement about an overall approach to collaborative decision making. So collective impact is one of several approaches to multi-sectoral collaboration, and it's gaining traction in the United States as a way to bring together governmental and non-governmental partners is defined as the commitment of a group of important actors from different sectors to a common agenda for solving a specific social problem and has much in common with health and all policies. So some of the five conditions that make collective impact successful and um, possibly different from traditional collaboration include having a common agenda, shared measurement systems, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and backbone, backbone support organizations. When you're building these intersectoral relationships, it's much like building relationships in your personal life. The same guiding principles apply, such as trust, offering help, giving credit, and shared values. So one example of co-benefits and win-win strategies for health and sustainability um, related to safety. So um, when you're looking at community safety, it says violence or fear of violence can make people unwilling to take public transportation, less supportive of high density living, or less likely to engage in community activities, all of which can impact health and healthy behaviors. As a result, reductions of violence and fear of violence can lead to reduced rates of injury and stress, as well as increased social and community cohesion and opportunities for physical activity. Increased community safety has potential co-benefits for several other agencies and community stakeholders, including transportation, air quality, law enforcement, businesses, parks and rec, planners, schools, and housing agencies. So this just gives an example of all the different um, areas that would be impacted or could, could positively, positively be impacted by working on community safety. So again, just gets you thinking um, maybe outside of your um, bubble and where you work and how you might be able to work with others that you haven't maybe worked with before. This is another um, example regarding farm to fork um, policies and programs where it makes uh, it easier for people and institutions to purchase product, produce from local farmers. Um, of course, it promotes health, affordable, nutritious, fresh fruits, all of those great things. So this can be related to economic development, agriculture, environmental, education, and disaster preparedness. So additional tips for health and all policies relationships. Of course, understand the context, share information ideas, be flexible, make introductions, language matters, collaboration takes time, and get the most out of meetings. 
Looking uh, a little bit more at language matters, this is a, another example they give about the word safety, which we um, talked about community safety in a couple of slides ago. So the common definition for the word safety is freedom from danger, risk, or injury. But the meaning of the word varies greatly depending on who um, is saying it or who is um, talking about it. So for example, in the criminal justice or police agencies, um, they may be talking about freedom from crime and violence. Local environmental health staff would be considering whether food products are free from contamination. Transportation agency staff may be discussing protection from injury and death for drivers, bicyclists, pedestrians, and road maintenance workers. Forestry staff may be expressing concern about ensuring a defensible space around homes and areas facing wildfire risk. Um, and then, of course, urban fire department staff may be referring to building features such as fire alarms and sprinkler systems. Labor agency staff would be talking about workplace precautions to prevent injury and exposure to toxins. So just making sure everyone's on the same page when you're talking about an issue and everyone's seeing it. Uh, they don't have to necessarily see it from the same perspective, but that everyone understands what uh, the common goal is and there's not, um, there's not get frustration um, because everyone's not understanding when they hear one word, they might be thinking of it a different way than the others. So these are all consistent with the dictionary definition of the word, but they illustrate the need to ensure understanding among a diverse group of what is meant by even commonplace words. So structures to support health and all policies, um, they can be formal or informal, um, and the goal of embedding health and governmental decision making is best supported by formal structures that are stable and foster long-term change. As I mentioned earlier, I think any work in this area is important, but the more formal structures are the ones that are probably gonna stick around a little longer and last. Um, of course, this initiative does require resources and it may um, require thinking creatively about sources of support and how you can um, move forward. So embedding health into government practices, improving one project or program at a time, changing policy and changing systems. Um, so those are all talking about government changes and policy changes, but at different levels. So you might be in the one project or program at a time, just looking at a proposed plan for a new building to identify ways to make it healthier, to improve the conditions for the hundreds of people who live there and those who live nearby. If you're looking at changing policy, it could be changing the current building code to require healthy design and the construction of all new multi-unit housing that would impact even more people for generations to come. And if you're looking at changing systems, it's incorporating a health lens into the process for changing the building code that might have an even larger impact across a much broader range of decisions that include, that go far beyond housing. So all um, good things, all looking at health and all policies, but at different levels, and um, those things are gonna last a little uh, longer depending on what level you're at. For structure and formality, again, formal approaches, um, they could include presidential executive orders, legislation, um, MOUs between interagencies, uh, county ordinances, uh, incorporating health and existing government practices. And informal approaches can be more of just a group of people that have a common goal and they're supporting that, um, responding to a natural disaster or creating regulatory changes. Um, examples of each of these will be offered later in the presentation to give you um, a better idea of some of the things that um, are going on right here in Illinois. So resources. Um, to do this work, you would need you would have staffing needs, some additional expenses, and potential um, resources. So things you want to ask yourself as you think about these resources: what funders are interested in health and all policies, transformative governance, intersectoral collaboration, healthy communities, or other related concepts, and might provide operational support. What funders are interested in policy areas that align with your interests, and they might want to support your project. Um, if a funder is only interested in one aspect of your work how will you address that one aspect sufficiently while maintaining the focus of the, the work or the priorities that, priorities that the group has agreed on? And are there partners and other agencies or organizations willing to assign staff or interns to work on implementing these projects? So you don't always necessarily need new staff or dedicated staff just to work on this issue, but there might be within the agencies or groups you're working with, they may be able to, be able to um, realign their resources to help with this need if it's important to them. So in creating healthy public policy, one of the health and all policy examples we'll discuss in more detail will cover more about the difficult and burdensome nature of trying to advocate for public policy changes, especially depending on your employer and whether or not you can or should be advocating for a specific policy change, or if instead you should be only be educating generally on the topic. 
So there's a lot of different factors and um, ways to look into this and to actually changing policy. So depending on where you're coming from, you would have to decide what the best route would be for you or what players to work with to try to, um, to work on your agenda. So deciding what to work on and identifying potential solutions. Of course, you have to determine your focus. Um, do you have data in alignment with your existing mission? Is there an executive leadership direction, um, a governor's executive order, potential impact and general appeal, legislation, health policy agenda, et cetera? Defining the problem and looking for solutions. Um, again, you could do a root cause mapping. We described that a little earlier. Um, it's an analytical tool for understanding fundamental causes of community health problems, but it can also be used to identify potential intervention points and possible partners. So again, different tools you can use to try to help you um, figure out exactly where you want to focus your efforts and your time. When you're, um, you can build on existing efforts or you can establish your priorities, which um, there could be co-benefits and win-wins, of course, collaboration, look at your cost, effectiveness, equity, feasibility, jurisdiction, the magnitude of your health impact, political will, specificity, and systems change, all things to consider when you're figuring out what you want to focus on and um, at what level. So early successes, I'm sorry, early successes are essential for building morale, developing relationships and trust, creating momentum, and establishing a track record that will encourage future investments of time or other resources. Um, of course, the low-hanging fruit is is important um, sometimes when you're establishing new um, relationships, with relationships with folks or partnerships upon a certain issue. So some examples of low-hanging fruit when you're looking at health and all policies initiatives, you can partner with another agency and convene a public input session. Um, you can host meet and greets between your partners that might want to work together or they have common goals. Um, collaborate to disseminate an existing but underutilized guidance document that has strong implications for health. Um, you can organize one-time workshops to educate on um, specific issues or policies. You can convene multiple agencies, and you can invite partner agencies to give input. And you can also be opportunistic. When the right partners are aligned and working together, some big wins may, in fact, be easy. So you just have to figure out, again, what your situation is, what you're working on, and what makes the most sense for you. So while the key elements of health and all policies include softer, less tangible outcomes, such as improved collaboration across government agencies and increased efficiency in government operations, it's also important to produce concrete, tangible deliverables as vehicles to guide policy and document progress. Some examples of these deliverables could include you know, comprehensive health strategies, action plans to carry out recommendations, policy papers, um, health impact assessments, um, resolutions, all good things when you're working towards a goal um, of creating deliverables that you actually can put your hand on and show people that you've done. So now I would like to take some time, um, now that we've talked about the Health and All Policies uh, initiative from a general perspective, and again, all of that great information is available online in that guide, and you could spend a lot of time going through it and trying to apply it to, to your work. Um, I'd like to give some examples a specific health and all policy uh, work that is going on in Illinois that um, incorporates this approach. I think we have some folks from Hillsborough Hospital here that might be able to answer some questions if we have any at the end, but um, the first example I'm going to give is sunscreen education. So as background, the Hillsborough Area Hospital was looking for a meaningful way to spend money that was given to them by the Montgomery County Cancer Association and together they agreed to focus on sunscreen education. So sunscreen was intentionally placed at the Hillsboro and Nokomis pools, sports complex, Bramer sanctuary, and area events for residents and visitors to use. The formal partners in this process was the Hillsboro Area Hospital and Montgomery County Cancer Association, but obviously they were working with other partners when they were placing the sunscreen and getting that um, approval to do so. The impact or benefit was a hope for decreased risk of skin cancer in the community. Of course, that may be something that they're not able to track um, officially, but um, common sense would say that if people are using um, sunscreen, they're less likely to get skin cancer. 
And this, this would be considered, I think, more of an informal community change. So this may be something that, since they started, it will be ongoing and they'll continue doing it, so it may be long-lasting. Um, but it did, they didn't have to change any policies, I do not believe, to do this. And this is a picture of one of the signs they had located at one of the facilities where they placed the sunscreen. They talked about why it's important to use it, how often you should apply it, and who is providing it to them um, to prevent skin cancer. So um, very important, um, more informal approach, but um, really glad that Hillsboro saw that um, as an option and initiated that. Another example of health and all policies, um, outdoor fitness stations along walking trails. So this maybe is a little bit more closely related, but outdoor fitness stations are placed along walking trails for community use. Potential partners in this would be park districts, cities, owner or responsible party of a walking trail, schools, etc. The impact or benefit could be increased physical activity for walkers, combating obesity, etc. And again, this might be a more informal or community change. Um, one example my colleague Patrice Jones gave is the De Decatur Park District is planning to add outdoor fitness stations on their walking path in Nelson Park. Um, it would be a well-rounded outdoor workout that can be enjoyed by people of all abilities and fitness levels throughout the community. Um, something similar, Memorial Hospital in Carthage also has a walking path in front of their hospital and they've also added fitness stations along um, their walking path. So a little bit more related, you would think of both of those as being more along um, health lines, but just adding another step to that and thinking about health. And here's a picture that I borrowed from Memorial Hospital's website of, of one of their outdoor stations at their walking path. The third example I want to talk about is a community health roundtable um, that's going on in Springfield. Um, I don't know if Dr. Stewart was able to join us, but he uh, or Arden, but either one of them would be able to provide more information on this if there are questions. But this is a more formal approach and more complex than the first two examples I gave. Um, Dr. Dave Stewart initiated this work and had helped, had hoped to join us today. Um, two other SIU colleagues, Arden Caffrey and TJ Albers, have also contributed to the work of the roundtable. Um, there's poor housing conditions that hurt Springfield children who disproportionately suffer from asthma and lead poisoning. In Springfield, poor housing exasperates childhood asthma and lead poisoning. Both asthma and lead poisoning require healthy housing for effective prevention, and children in rental properties are more often diagnosed with those, these hazards, but the burden of unhealthy housing impacts all of Springfield's residents. So Dr. Stewart convened a group of community leaders, and they began meeting a little over two years ago, who all shared a common interest in making a positive impact in Springfield. And because of their interest in, in the work that they did and the research, they originally agreed to focus on the health of children, and then more specifically focus on housing conditions because of the information I just gave. So their issue is lack of well-functioning formal inspection process or a good, if good landlord list for housing in Springfield. This group meets monthly. And they think that to protect Springfield children, all housing must be healthy housing. 39% of asthma and lead poisoning cases in children under six can be traced to residential exposure to indoor hazard, indoor air hazard, I'm sorry, and lead paint chips and dust. So fostering a healthy and safe community is vitally important for children and their future health and career potential. So I think currently, if I understand it correctly, um, all inspections are complaint driven. So inspectors can only get in if they have permission. And tenants are sometimes intimidated with the fear of eviction, so they don't make the complaints that maybe are needed to um, improve their housing conditions or the rental housing conditions. Um, cities across the country have established housing ordinances known as proactive rental inspections. The programs can require the registration of rental properties, regularly scheduled inspections, and enforcement of repairs to properties that do not meet code. This is one option for Springfield to start on the path to healthier children and a healthier city. So the Community Health Roundtable, again, they're a little more formal. They've um, established or developed a vision and mission statement. So Sangamon County citizens and leaders continuously assess and strive to create the behavioral, clinical, physical, and socioeconomic conditions that allow people to achieve optimal health and well-being. And their mission is to champion community understanding of the factors underlying good health so that, so that action to improve them becomes expected and habitual. And along um, those lines, they've also developed their own strategies of analysis, awareness, alignment, advocacy, and action. So and their analysis would be acquire, develop, and present evidence related to identify community health needs. For awareness, they're publicizing the evidence, foster general public awareness. 
for alignment, they're providing a forum for conversation, formalizing relationships with experts and partners. And a good example of that is they've invited um, a local housing development person to the table to participate in the conversation. They're working toward local policy adoption and proposed implementation strategies from an advocacy standpoint, and they incentivize and undertake coordinated efforts to implement findings um, in their actions. So their overall goal is to continuously improve the health of children in our community by enhancing the physical environment in which they live. And their current project would be to advocate for housing policies to protect Springfield's children from unhealthy living conditions that lead to serious health problems like lead poisoning and asthma. I mentioned that their partners, um, Dr. Stewart originally, I think, had about a dozen folks he was meeting with, and now they're up to about 18 or 19 committed participants that are represent the following groups. So the Farm Bureau, Springfield Public Schools, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Greater Springfield Chamber of Commerce, United Way, Neighborhood Associations, uh, University of Illinois Springfield, Frontiers International, Springfield City Council, of course, the SIU School of Medicine, and the Community Foundation of the Land of Lincoln. And I think a few of their somewhat newer partners would include the two major hospital systems in Springfield, the Springfield Project, Faith Coalition, and a, again, as I mentioned, a housing development representative that obviously have a lot of um, inside information um, and business information, industry information that maybe the other folks wouldn't have had otherwise. I think some of the lessons this group has learned, um, it's sometimes hard to measure success and outcomes as we talked about before, so finding those tangible results. It's also, you have to be careful to walk that fine line of educating and advocating, depending on who your employer is, and trying to work within the existing structure of the Springfield community, the city council, or whatever other group you're working with. Um, this group has created a really nice one-pager that summarized their work. Um, it's Better Housing for Healthier Children. It's a great handout that um, helps when they're meeting with people, they can um, let them know what their interests are and why they're doing these, um, why they're focusing in this area. And they've also created a heat map. I believe this is from 2014, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, it shows the relative frequency of residents of pediatric ER visits for asthma living in Springfield in one year. So the darker yellow is the high frequency location. The plain yellow and green is gradually less frequency. And um, this shows that you can obviously see that the, a lot of the kids that are suffering from um, asthma and having these ER visits because of the asthma are living in the same area for the most part. So what is the issue? And it's likely the housing, and that's why they're focused on that. And again, these visuals and one-pagers are so important when you're advocating for a cause. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, the resources I would suggest if you're interested in learning more about health and all policies would be um, the American Public Health Association, Centers for Disease Control, um, and the Office of Associate Director of Policy. And again, the Public Health Institute, this is where I found the guide that I pulled most of this information. Um, and it, there, again, the citation for that guide, you can download it online and uh, start using it today. And here's my contact information. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them or ask one of my colleagues to answer them. And if there aren't any questions, that's fine too. We can uh, be done a little early. But I hope that this was helpful to you, and I hope that you can think about some of these um, notions when you're working in, um, in whatever field you're in. And I hope it will be helpful to you as you move forward in your work. Yes, you will have access to the PowerPoint. I believe that it will be emailed out to you um, sometime after today uh, by U of I Extension. Kathy or Nancy, feel free to correct me. No, that's correct. We can certainly um, do that. So uh, I'm, it's, it's, I'll type a question into the chat. If folks of you uh, have thoughts or questions that you'd love to put into the chat space, we'd welcome your uh, discussion that way. Looks like Ian. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. It looks like Ian's asking how you measure the impacts of the community changes that we're recommending. Um, is Dr. Stewart or Patrice or Dr. Vora, would one of you like to 
um, tackle that since you've been involved in Community Health Roundtable probably more than I have? Dr. Vora? Maybe not. Um, so, Ian, honestly, I don't have, um, I was hoping that someone else would be able to answer that since they're more involved in that. But I think as they're moving forward, they're, I'm guessing they're going to try to track that heat map as they're making progress and try to see if that improves. Um, and that's probably why they pulled that information to begin with. Um, I, this is similar but not exactly related, but something else we're involved in is um, a medical legal partnership in Springfield. Because of issues like lead poisoning and asthma that are happening in the rental housing um, areas, we've um, teamed up, I think we have a grant, to place an attorney within our clinic space. And then um, that when people come in and they're sick and there's a reason why that can be dealt with in, um, from a legal perspective, such as their housing is, is substandard and they need to deal with um, with landlords, then the attorney can step in and help them go through the legal process to make those improvements they need to make them healthier. So I, that didn't come, I don't think, from the Community Health Roundtable, but it's related to what they're doing. So I'm sure they're trying to track that as well and see how many of their clients um, are being helped from that in that way. Laura, do you see Ann posed another question about are there some really some examples that you're aware of of community plans um, that that would help people to see what how communities are organizing to to deal with these complex issues at a, a community or county level. So the community plans that first come to mind um, for me would be the I plans that the public health departments are required to. Um, create as well as the community health needs assessments that not-for-profit um, hospitals are re required to uh, produce and those are every three to five years for each of those and I think a lot of times those um, do include lots of examples of um, health, community health issues that they need to address. I think in some counties they're, they spend more time on those plans um, outside of the time when they have to produce them than others and I think that's becoming more common where they're trying to, to address those. I think some of the issues in those plans don't change. A lot of times obesity or um, or uh, other items like that might be included. Sometimes they may be more specific to asthma or something else, but I think that um, that's one way that communities are trying to address those. And as far as case examples, I know that, um, I don't know if there's any specific to what we're talking about today, but of course Western Illinois University's Institute for Rural Affairs used to um, put out some great rural papers that might be related to this, and I think Dr. Vora's office at SIU, the Office of Population Science and Policy, are starting to work on some white papers that might, again, address issues like this, and um, I would ask for Dr. Vora to jump in if he has anything to add. And it looks like Nancy asked about um, how those in the field would organize a community health round table as far as questions they'd pose to those participants, making sure that all are at the table and planning next steps. And are there particular parts of the state that you're looking at that this happen? So um, the community health round table that I talked about, I think they're focused solely in Springfield or just Sangamon County, I believe. Um, and again, that was Dr. Stewart's interest in him bringing those partners together, that he had those contacts um, to focus on that. I would um, bet that he would be willing to have a conversation with someone if someone was wanting to set something up similar. I don't want to volunteer for him, but he's pretty easygoing, and I think he'd probably be willing to help in that area. Um, our office covers the southernmost 66 counties of the state, so uh, all of Sutherland and, and much of central Illinois, depending on where you're looking at uh, the line being drawn. And so our office is happy to um, help if, the, if you're in our counties, we're happy to help. If you're out of our counties, we might be able to help as well. But um, we have representation um, in outreach positions like myself where we're happy to, happy to help communities if we have the time and resources to do so. And it looks like Dr. Forrest said he can't get his voice to come through, but he's happy to provide information about the office's work. And he's provided in the chat box the phone number and email address for his office. Patrice, if you... 
um, would like to unmute yourself and hopefully you could answer. It looks like you had a something. To... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, in regards to the round table, the way that that kind of came about, uh, the topic of asthma and lead is um, there was a, pres um, a person, the homeless coordinator for the local school district uh, gave a presentation to the round table uh, regarding homelessness um, in the school district. And from that presentation, I mean, there was, you know, it was very difficult to narrow down um, exactly um, what the round table would focus on. But that conversation from um, the presentation and conversation from the homeless coordinator from the school district started the ball rolling um, with this um, round table to start focusing on issues, um, health related issues as it pertains to, to, to the students uh, and kids in um, Springfield. Thank you, Patrice. Are there other um, comments or questions? I think that was, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Anne's comment, Laura. I think um, the examples that you gave us were, were really um, ins inspirational in, in thinking about, I, I love the sunscreen example of, you know, really um, going to that area of greatest need in our communities and a really simple thing that, that folks could um, undertake that that would have significant impact. And then the the other examples, of course, of what you're sharing in, in Springfield is really looking at a very complex issue and, and bringing those key partners together for a conversation and problem solving. It's a great example. Thank you. So we will um, send, I think Nancy has a poll question that we'd like to have your feedback on today's program. If there are no further questions, and we greatly appreciate your participation today and know that the slides and the references that Laura's provided to us will be made available so that you can um, think about how to tackle these issues in each of your own communities and know that you have a great partner um, and resource in the SIU School of Medicine that as well as extension that would be interested in working with you as you grapple with these complex issues. Thank you, Laura. Um, excellent presentation and very insightful discussions today.